So the judge denied the TRO to the state of Tennessee and Virginia. TRO, temporary restraining order. What's this mean in the grand scheme of things, and will this have any effect on next Tuesday's court hearing? NCAA investigation versus Tennessee, all that and more. And you're on a Thursday, Locked On Balls. You are Locked On Balls, your daily podcast on the Tennessee Volunteers. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, good Thursday morning, everybody. Welcome to Locked On Vols, a part of the Locked On Podcast Network, where it is your team every single day. You guys know it. Every dayers can't do it without you. Thanks, as always, for making Locked On Vols your first listen, your first watch on YouTube, where you can subscribe for free. And, of course, download this podcast wherever you get your podcast for completely free. Got a fun show coming up here today, as I am your host, Eric Kane. You can always follow me in the show on Twitter at underscore Kane or at Locked On Vols. My boss, Brent Hubs, VolQuest.com. I try to get people on the show that are smarter than me, and they can explain some of these legalities better than I can. So Brent Hub's coming on uh, to talk about the TRO denial earlier in the week here in segment number one. Uh, VFL's in the Super Bowl, and how many players from the Southeastern Conference and some of these teams from the Southeastern Conference are playing in the Super Bowl? Plus, what did Trey Smith and Juwan Jennings, who are playing in the Super Bowl, have to say about Tennessee? That's in segment number two. And then a hoops recap, Tennessee and LSU in segment number three. So, without further ado, I'm going to step aside here. Brent Hubs, VolQuest.com, talking about Tennessee versus the NCAA, but more importantly, the state of Tennessee and Virginia and the joint lawsuits getting the temporary restraining order denied earlier this week. Here's Brent Hubs. All right, Brent, so the state of Tennessee and Virginia denied the TRO um, you know, with the NCAA. That came down on Tuesday evening. W- what's this mean? Break it down to us like we're five years old. What's this mean? Is this a huge blow to Tennessee? Does it really matter? W- what does the TRO being denied mean for this whole situation? I-, I don't think ultimately it means anything based on everybody you've talked to and everything you've read out there. Um, there's a couple of different things in talking to some legal people. And again, I, I don't, I don't know legal jargon. I don't know legal posturing, um, very well. That's just, that's, I mean, I, I didn't, I went to school to avoid math and I went to the school to avoid stuff like law. Um, <laughs> and, and, but, but I think when you look at it, the, the, the temporary restraining order was going to be such a short period of time. It was going to be a week. Um, and, and I think that, if I'm the judge and um, everybody knows you're from the state of Tennessee and you're here in this case, I, I think you, you want to make sure that nobody says, well, the, the, you know, the NCAA didn't get a shot because he's just a Tennessee guy. Yeah. Right. Um, now nobody should say that this guy's a, an appointed federal judge, but you know how things are. So your appeals process and all that moving forward. The other thing too, is some people have told me that a lot of times the, the temporary restraining order stuff is sent over to a judge, not necessarily with hopes of winning that the temporary restraining order, but just to get your facts in front of the judge ahead of time. Yeah. And if you look at it from that perspective, it looks like it's a positive and it worked for Tennessee because he basically says in the ruling, Hey, that, you know, there's a violation of the Sherman act here, which is the antitrust, which is the whole case. It certainly gives the appearance like the NCAA is going to lose. That's what a lot of people have deducted from the ruling that that came down uh, on Tuesday. So, uh, you know, th- this thing starts next Tuesday in, in Greenville, and, and we'll see what happens when it goes from there. I mean, you had Tom Marr putting out Eric earlier uh, on Wednesday about, you know, maybe a notice of allegations never arrives now for Tennessee. Uh, we'll see what, what happens, and, and we'll start to really see that on Tuesday, whether you won the restraining order or you didn't, it all resets itself on Tuesday when you go to court. Yeah. That kind of led my, led to my next question about the notice of allegations at the time of this recording, Tennessee still not formally, you know, received some does Tuesday play an effect of that. Austin was maybe under the impression earlier in the week that Austin price on the ball quest podcast that, that maybe you hold off on that to see how Tuesday goes. Um, when do you think timeline wise for a notice of allegations and, and did Tuesday kind of hamper that at all? Uh, you know, it's a great question. Um, and talking to some people, I don't think Tennessee felt like or has felt like a notice of allegations was imminent, uh, meaning that it was coming um, in short order, meaning like last week or, yeah. you know, right after the, the news broke of, of that. So 
Um, yeah, I mean, I think if you're the NCAA, you you got to be sitting there saying, hey, how far down the rat, how far down the hole do we want to go with this? Are we going to continue on a fight after we've just, you know, if we lose a court case, do we even want to, you know, pursue that? I mean, I, I think you probably put that on hold and, um, you know, wait and see if, if you lose, see what kind of appeal process you have out there and kind of where that goes next. I mean, what's fascinating, I think, is missed a little bit by some people in this is, this is not the NCAA versus the University of Tennessee next Tuesday. This is the state of Tennessee and the state of Virginia versus the NCAA. I mean, Tennessee's not – the University of Tennessee's not filed a suit on anything at this point. Neither has the Spire group. I mean, this is the attorney general from the state of Tennessee representing the state of Tennessee in an antitrust case against the NCAA, and Virginia has joined in with it. So – you know, there's a potential another layer there of possible suit if needed, but we'll see kind of what comes out of Tuesday. I still don't think it's going to be over Tuesday, regardless of whatever ruling is. I still think it's going to linger on out there for a while, but but Tuesday will be an interesting step for sure. Um, why, you know, Virginia obviously jumping in with the state of Tennessee and doing this together. I think a lot of the talk was, oh, well, let's see all these other states are going to jump in as well to this point that hasn't happened. Do you think that plays a factor into it at all? It probably looks better to have 12 states on your side, but does that really change anything if it's just 12 or just the two that it is now? No, I don't think it changes anything because, I mean, the, what's going to be heard is the state of Tennessee versus the NCAA because Virginia attached themselves to the case, but but it's still, it's still the state of Tennessee that's bringing it up. Um, so I, I, you know, I, I don't think the facts of the case changes, whether you've got one state involved, two states involved or 12 states involved. I think there's a bunch of states watching this to see what happens and, um, we'll go accordingly much the same way we have seen in NIL rulings, right? Hey, this, this, this state won that high school kids can, can get NIL money. Okay. We're going to follow suit now. And then, you know, it, there's a little bit of a copycat deal because, what happens is everybody wants to be on the same level playing field. Nobody wants a single state to have an advantage and every state has its own set of laws and its own set of rules. And, and so when it's a state by state cases, what you're looking at in other states is going, Hey, this, the state X have an advantage over us. If they do, then we need to look at that. That's why you saw so many people go with the high school kids can make money. Because they felt like, okay, that's a huge advantage for a state, you know, um, versus another state school. And, and that's obviously, you, you you know, if you want to win in the political world, side with football, right? <laughs> in your home state, it, se it seems to work out, you know, pretty well for, for people that they go that way. So, um, you know, that's part of it. I think that's going to be the, the challenge, you know, whenever we get to the point and everybody talks about labor law right? Somebody's going to be an employee. Well, how labor laws work in Tennessee is different than how labor laws work in Georgia. So how do you get a whole conference under the umbrella? You know, I think that's something that you have to, you know, that will be out there for examine. I think Andy Staples talked about this in one of his podcasts for on three, when he said, you know, one of the things some people consider is maybe you, you follow the state guidelines where the conference office is, so that everybody in the conference is under the same umbrella, because that'll be one of the challenges if we ever get to that point. Uh, last question, you know, Tom Mars, you know, we're talking about separating all this, like what's going on right now is the state of Tennessee, the state of Virginia, NCAA. This is not the University of Tennessee. This is not Spire. You know, all this is kind of separate. But Tom Mars has been a name that is out there. And a lot of Tennessee fans have, have you know, done some research. Who is the guy, the attorney mm -hmm. represents Spire Sports Group? He's been active on Twitter, been active on social media. Um, you know, why should, at this point in time, why should Tennessee fans feel good about Tom Mars and, and what will Tom Mars be doing in this whole scheme of things right now? Because right now, again, it's, it's, it's the States against the NCAA. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily Spire who he is representing. Well, I think that, you know, Tom Mars and his group have remained on retainer for Tennessee. They mm -hmm. obviously use that group in helping with the last case that the university of Tennessee did. So I think he is a guy that they're comfortable with. I think he's a guy that has not only knowledge of NCAA proceedings and how to address NCAA proceedings, he's had success, you know, in, in, in 
winning against the NCAA and, and, you know, the enforcement committee or infractions committees or whatever committee you're going before. Uh, so I think that that is a valuable resource. Now, he's obviously very active on Twitter. He wants everybody to know who, who he is, but he's very knowledgeable. He's very smart. I think Michigan is using him and has used him through, throughout everything they've dealt with the last few months. And, and he's been, in, you know, done some things for Tennessee um, for a long, for a long period of time. So, uh, I, I think that he will continue to be kind of a a guy that Spire and other people are using as a consultant with the idea of maybe never having to fully use him, but he's just being a consultant. But he's a guy who has knowledge in cases against the NCAA because he has been in suits against the NCAA for many years. Always good stuff there from Brent Hubs. Check out all of our work over at VolQuest.com as we continue to move on with this saga. Tuesday is going to be a big day, as Brent Hubs allu- alluded to, and we'll break it all down for you right here on Locked On Vols. Hey, coming up, VFL's in the Super Bowl. What does Juwan Jennings, what does Trey Smith have to say? And uh, the breaking down the number of players from each conference in Super Bowl 58. That's coming up next right here on Locked On Vols. I want to tell you about our friends over at FanDuel Sportsbook. It's America's number one sportsbook. Super Bowl 58, it's coming up this Sunday. I know you guys probably already had your plans. I'm going over to hang out with my buddy Logan. We got the spread all down. We've got you know the beers on ice. Maybe not yet, but they'll be on ice. Don't worry. Getting ready for a big Super Bowl fun field time. It's going to be awesome to see not only the game, not only the VFLs in the Super Bowl, but the halftime show, the commercials. It's truly a spectacle, and I'm going to try to win big time on this last football game of the season, and you can do it sport at a FanDuel Sportsbook. Spreads, totals, individual prop bets, those are so popular around the Super Bowl. And, you know, for those of you guys that may be listening or watching or have friends that don't really have much interest in football, the individual prop bets are super easy on Super Bowl weekend. And again, you can put some coin in your pocket and finish off the, the season with a W. New customers today can join, and you'll get $200 in bonus bets if your first bet of $5 or more wins. All you got to do is go to FanDuel.com slash locked on to sign up. That is FanDuel.com slash locked on. You can make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sportsbook partner of the NFL. We'll go back in here to your Thursday edition of Locked On Vols. We had uh, Brent Hubs on in segment number one. We'll talk Tennessee hoops in segment number two. But uh, I did want to break down some numbers a little bit. We're not going to talk a ton of Super Bowl here because, I mean, quite frankly, it's um, – you know, it's it's not Tennessee football. There are some former balls that we're going to touch on here in segment number two uh, that are playing in the Super Bowl this weekend, and that's always fun. But I did want to kind of break down some of the numbers, and and our buddy David Cobb over at CBS Sports did a good job of of doing that on a recent um, on a recent article that he published. And I always find it interesting where players come from who were in the Super Bowl. I didn't get into the nitty gritty and determine the three stars, the unranked players, the four, the five stars all that type of stuff. But with the help of David Cobb over at CBS Sports, we do have a layout of you know the schools with the most former players in the Super Bowl. Uh, the SEC once again leads all conferences with 23 players in this year's Super Bowl. That's up from two players. 21 uh, was the number last year. So the SEC continues to lead the way in that regard. And, and, and mind you, that's with Alabama having no players in this current Super Bowl. That's kind of hard to believe, right? No player from Alabama is in this current Super Bowl, but uh, we're counting Oklahoma in the SEC now, right? Yes, we are. Oklahoma has six players. Six former Sooners are in Super Bowl 58. Georgia, uh, which is no surprise because it's been the cream of the crop of the college football world the last couple of years, um, has got five former Bulldogs in the the Super Bowl uh, Bowl 58. Um, Florida has four. Uh, You got some other notables from the SEC that I'll get to in a moment. Other programs from around college football that have a couple Michigan's got four middle Tennessee hey the Blue Raiders middle Tennessee has three Penn State has three Rutgers has three TCU has three um you've got two players each from SEC programs such as Arkansas LSU Mississippi State Missouri South Carolina and Tennessee of course with Juwan Jennings and Trey Smith you got one player each from a couple of these SEC programs such as Kentucky, Vanderbilt, and yeah, so that makes up the Southeastern Conference. Um, nonetheless, 21, 23 players from the SEC, 19 players from the Big Ten, 17 players from the New Look Big 12, 12 from the Pac-12, and I guess that's 
Well, depending on how you look at it, I guess the Pac-12 is from last year. It's not the new Pac-12 because there's only two teams in that regard. So maybe the 23 from Tennessee or the 23 from the SEC doesn't even include Oklahoma, uh, which would be interesting. But nonetheless, any way you want to look at it, Oklahoma and Texas are part of the SEC now moving forward. But the SEC is continuing to lead in that regard. Um, find it interesting too, just you know, looking at the streaks for Tennessee in terms of. You know, the success that Tennessee football players have had in the Super Bowl. You've got um, Tennessee is now it has the second most Super Bowl winning players of all times, meaning players who have gone on to win Super Bowls. Tennessee is the second highest among colleges they come from, which is really, really cool. I mean, you got Peyton Manning, you've got um, Gerard, uh, Gerard Mayo, you've got, um, you know, Tom, Derek Barnett. I mean, just a, Trey Smith, just a couple that, uh, to name a few, uh, here in recent memory that have gone on to win Super Bowls, but Tennessee has the second most Super Bowl winning players of all time. That's not a bad stat as well. Um, Sunday will mark the 106th appearance of an NFL Vol in the Super Bowl. So Sunday will be the 106th time that Tennessee is represented in the Super Bowl. Again, Jawan Jennings and Trey Smith doing that. So Tennessee, again, not only produces talent, not only historically has won so many games, um, it's also played on the biggest stage and and shown the power tee on the biggest stage. And what I mean by showing the power tee, sure, the power tee is not on the side of their helmets or anything. They're not wearing a Tennessee jersey. But as we know, Super Bowl week, it's a spectacle. You got Radio Row. You got tons and tons of interviews. You had Media Day earlier this week. And a couple of NFL reporters caught up with both Juwan Jennings and Trey Smith. Um, short little sound bites I do want to play here. So give this a listen. This is what Juwan Jennings had to say about representing Tennessee, representing his state, and doing it all on the grand stage this week. Just a blessing, uh, extremely amazing, and uh, just uh, just representing um, everybody from Tennessee, representing the 49ers. And I have a lot of family out here. Um, everybody's rooting for me, and I just can't wait to bring it back to Tennessee. Yeah. Dreaming about it, and um, I used to tell myself as a kid, all I got to do is just keep going to work every day, and um, you know that's 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 my life now. Just going to work Monday through Sunday. So awesome stuff there from Juwan Jennings. Again, a brief clip, and this one's going to be a brief clip as well. Trey Smith was asked uh, earlier this week in Media Day, um, you know, what it means to represent Tennessee as well. And this is uh, an audio clip courtesy of CBS Sports. Uh, Ball Nation, uh, go balls. That's it. Keep it simple. Uh, you know, we're keeping the streak with the uh, volunteers in the Super Bowl. My man Juwan Jennings on the other side of it. Best of luck to you, brother. I've uh, been playing numerous games with them, so... You know, Ball Nation, love you. Thank you for the support. GBO, baby. All right, so some good stuff there. And, of course, those guys are going to be on opposite sides. Trey Smith for the Kansas City Chiefs. Juwan Jennings for the San Francisco 49ers. I mean, Trey Smith's been one of the best offensive linemen, especially young offensive linemen, interior offensive linemen in the NFL since being taken in the, not the first, not the second, not the third, not the fourth, but the, not the fifth, but the sixth round a couple of seasons ago. And, uh, what a what a great situation for him being plugged late in that draft and, and by a good established franchise at the time. And he's gone on to have some success. And Juwan Jennings had a really, really bad pro day, um, ran about a 4-7 in his pro day. I know he's faster than that, but um, was taken in the seventh round by the 49ers. Didn't make the active roster that first year, was put on a futures contract and then just continue to work and chip away and chip away and chip away. And he, he's he been a vital part of that offense. He's not going to be a receiver that's going to have 100 receptions in a season or anything like that, or he's never going to be that guy. He's probably never going to be a pro bowler. But, you know, that dog in him, you know, blocking, emotional leader, um, you know, getting, you know, possession top receiver, a uh, huge play in the NFC Championship game when Brock Purdy was kind of on the run, kind of threw across his body there to the markers, and he went up and made the catch high. What a big play in that game. And Juwan Jennings has made some of those plays throughout his career. So really, really cool to see both Trey Smith and, and Juwan Jennings uh, excel in the NFL. And I can't wait to see which one of those guys wins a Super Bowl. So uh, VFL is in the uh, Super Bowl. Not just VFL is in the NFL. VFL is in the Super Bowl. It's uh, really, really, really fun to watch. Hey, when we come back, we'll look at um, Tennessee and LSU. Recap that basketball game all here on Locked On Balls. Game time is the fast and easy way to buy tickets for all your sporting events, but not just your sporting events in your area, or maybe if you want to travel to a, a sporting event, but also music, comedy, theater, whatever event that's 
uh, you know, really, really just kind of get you going, if you will. <laughs> uh, you can buy tickets to that event over on the Game Time app. Uh, killer last minute deals, all in prices, views from your seats. Uh, you got their best price guarantee as well. Game Time, it takes the guesswork out of buying tickets. And right now, users can get $100 off when they buy a big game ticket with the promo code VEGAS100. That's VEGAS100. Uh, again, it's for the procrastinators out there that wait to the last minute to purchase your tickets. Uh, even at the Game Time app, you can buy a ticket to your event an hour after the event has even started. It's got the lowest price guarantee, which means if you find a cheaper ticket in your same section than the one that Game Time provided you, they're going to credit you 110% of the value of that ticket. That's not bad right there. Plus, job loss protection, even event cancellation protection over at the Game Time app. So take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Right now, all Game Time users can get $100 off the big game ticket with promo code VEGAS100. Terms apply. Just download the Game Time app, put in the promo code VEGAS100, V-E-G-A-S 100 for $100 off, $100 off the big game ticket. Or if you're not going to the game, you can use promo code Locked On for $20 off your first purchase. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price, guaranteed. Tennessee Hoops recap coming up next right here on Locked On Balls. 88 to 68, a 20 point victory for Tennessee over LSU. And this is kind of just what the doctor ordered, right? Uh, you wanted to start off this, this three week stretch where, as we kind of talked about, Tennessee really needs to be stacking up those W's before you end on a brutal, uh, I mean, I'll call it brutal. I mean, it's tough. I mean, Tennessee can certainly win the majority of those, but a rough two week stretch to end the regular season with the, with the likes of you know South Carolina again, and um, you've got uh, you know Kentucky in that mix, and you got Auburn in that mix. I mean, you got you got a tough little stretch there. So you need to start stacking up these W's. And Tennessee got off to a good start in doing that with the first of six games over the next three week span. It's Eighty-eight to sixty-eight, a twenty point win in Thompson Bowling Arena at the Food City Center, and uh, Tennessee finished the game on a 7-0 run in the last minute 33 answering it was a 13-0 run they cut the deficit down to 10 points with about six minutes and some change left and things were getting kind of interesting there and and, and poor cam Carr, who i think is going to have just a great career i really like watching cam Carr. um he goes in he plays two minutes no points over three from the field and he was minus nine on the plus minus in in two minutes um, he was on the court for the bulk of that 13-0 run, and again, he's going to be a fine player, but that was kind of a brutal stat line, because my first thing was like, the whole time was like, all right, even since Tennessee got off to a good start, and when Tennessee held a, a job, I mean, I believe it was 20 points at halftime, was it not? I'll have to go back and, let's see here, let's see here, can I not see it? Anyway, I don't, I don't have the... I don't... Okay, here we go. Um, 52-27, so I mean, it was, yeah, it was... Um, it was a uh, you know twenty three point halftime lead for Tennessee at the half, and so um, I just kept on thinking, got to play young guys, got to play young guys, got to play young guys. But when LSU goes on that thirteen zero run to cut it within ten with six and some change left, it makes it kind of difficult to do that. And I don't like the fact that in this game you had thirty five minutes on the court from Dalton Connect, you had thirty six minutes on the court from Sakai Ziegler, who was averaging thirty five minutes in his last eight games. Um, he, I believe that's correct. 35 minutes on the court in this, in, in SEC play at least. And, and that is so much, you know, for a guy coming off an ACL injury. And I know this is not, you know, five, 10 years ago when things were very much different regarding the ACL, but man, that's a lot of minutes. And this is a game that you really want to kind of get him some rest if you will. Uh, but again, that late run from LSU didn't kind of allow that 35 minutes from Dom connect 36 minutes from Zakai Ziegler, uh, 29 minutes from Jonas Adu. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's some minutes that were a little bit too high, and what uh, ended up being a twenty uh, to the twenty point lead. But overall, a twenty point win. Overall, I mean, Tennessee was fantastic in this basketball game. Uh, Tennessee shot fifty five percent from the field, and despite being out rebounded forty to twenty six on the game, despite being uh, beaten up on the boards on the offensive boards eighteen to five, Tennessee is able to shoot at fifty five percent, assist on. 23 of its 31 made field goals and you know dialed up from downtown as well Tennessee on the game was 11 to 24 it was 9 to 13 in the first half from downtown and Tennessee was just able to shoot and stay hot and how many times over the years have we said man if Tennessee just had any type of offense if Tennessee could just you know have any type you know give up some defense for a little bit of offense 
this could be a Final Four team. Well, we've seen here lately, and we've seen earlier in the season. We saw on Saturday night, and we're seeing here at home on a Wednesday night against an LSU team that's not good. But we're seeing this offense come alive, 88 points, 103 points against Kentucky the, uh, the night before. I mean, Tennessee's put up 90 uh, a couple of other times this season. So um, this is an offense that is is much, much better th- than what Tennessee's had. And, of course, it helps when you got when you got to have a guy like, like Don Connect. Don Connect, 27 points on the night. A career-high seven rebounds, which I don't like this stat, but it just kind of goes along with how Tennessee got bullied on the boards. Seven rebounds, a career-high for Dalton Connect. Rick Barnes said post-game should have been 11, which is typical Rick Barnes fashion. But yeah, 27 points, seven rebounds, six assists for Dalton Connect. He was not a 19 from the field, a shade under 50%. Uh, two of five from long distance, seven to nine from the charity stripe. A really, really solid game for Dalton Connect. And... um you know, on the SEC network, when they went back to the studios, you know, they were talking about um, how Dalton Connects, you know, got SEC Player of the Year wrapped up. And I mean, I would agree that he's going to win it, but like, they, you know, in the studio, they they were talking, they were talking like it was all said and done, and he's going to be making a run with Edie for National Player of the Year. And I, I agree, he's going to be making a run. Um, but there's a lot of basketball left to be played. But how about that? A guy, you know, that Tennessee has already been talking about as a slam dunk case closed sec player of the year you know grant was the sec player of the year um you know when he was here that was that was really really fun to watch but um the the way they were talking about it was some finality in their tones and it being february the 7th at the time of the game it's pretty surprising but don't connect really really strong game liked what i saw from him jordan ganey coming off the bench in 26 minutes he scored 18 points six to nine shooting from the field three of six from downtown um, had three assists, had two rebounds, did a little bit of everything. That's what you like to see from Jordan Ganey, man. I mean, just come on, add a little splash, being a sharpshooter off the bench. 18 points in this one. Jemai Meshack, only six points, in, uh, but only played 13 minutes. Um, surprising in this one, Santiago Vescovi, two points, one of three shootings, so he barely shot the ball. 21 minutes. 21 minutes played. And Josiah Jordan James um, thought that he was starting to feel himself a little bit. Finished with eight points, which is... Pretty good, you know, considering, you know, where he's been the last month. Not as good as what he did at Kentucky, of course, but eight points. He was a perfect three for three from the field, made two three pointers. So, you know, if it's a lack of confidence, shoot the ball more. And I know it's a blowout and you're trying to share the wealth and all that, but goodness gracious, you were perfect from the floor. You know, continue to be seeking out your own shot and creating your own offense right now, young man. Uh, I say young man, he's a fifth year senior or fourth year, yeah, fifth year senior. Uh, any way you want to look at it, Tennessee did a really, really good job in this game. 88-68. Uh, did get bullied on the boards, which is not great. Um, but it's a game where you won by 20 points, so it's hard to it's hard to really, really complain about some things. Uh, plus minuses. I really like to look at that. Let's look at the plus minuses. I already mentioned Cam Cars was minus nine in two minutes of game action where he was over three from the field. You had a plus 31 for Jonas to do, which is just really good. 10 points on, uh, on on five rebounds. You had plus 26 for Zakai Ziegler. You had plus 17 for Jonas, uh, Josiah Jordan James. You had plus 15 for Dalton Connect. Plus 14 for Santiago Vescovi and for Jordan Ganey. You had two... For J.P. Estrella, plus two. You had plus one for Jamon Meshack. You had minus 11 for Toby Iwaka. Toby Iwaka, who played 11 minutes, again, on the court during that run there towards the end. 11 minutes, two personal fouls, one rebound, no points. Minus 11 for Toby Iwaka, and minus nine, of course, for Cameron Carr. But anyway, Tennessee gets the big win. That's good to see, and Tennessee will hit the road to College Station to take on the Aggies this weekend and needs to pick up win number two of this six-game stretch that you really need to take advantage of. All right, that's going to do it here for a Thursday edition of Locked On Vols. Big thanks to Brent Huss for stopping by the show and uh, talking to us a little bit about the TRO in the state of Tennessee and Virginia. Of course, we talked a little VFLs in the NFL, heard from Juwan Jennings and Trey Smith, and we recapped the Tennessee basketball dub. What's coming up on Friday's show? Well, any latest developments in the NCAA versus Tennessee, and we'll get you set for that Aggie matchup over the weekend. All that and more. That is coming up on a Friday Lockdown Balls. Appreciate you so much. Thank you for listening and tuning us in here on Lockdown Balls. And we will talk again tomorrow, everybody. This is Lockdown Balls. <laughs>